Welcome to the next episode of Great War Story, the story of HMS Hampshire. Now, the Hampshire was doomed to a terrible fate. She would sink with almost all hands, but I'm not going to be talking much about that part of her story. I'm going to be talking about an earlier episode in which she helped out the Anzacs as the fleet of Australians and New Zealanders crossed the Indian Ocean and eventually got off in Egypt. Now, the opening image I've used is not a particularly good one, but I like it because it was actually taken from the troop ship that was carrying my grandfather, the Monganui. And as you know, all of these episodes in some way or other revolve around my grandfather's story in World War I, and this may possibly be of a view, a view that my grandfather himself may have seen. Now, the terrible fate that I was referring to occurred on June the 5th, 1916. She was leaving Scarpa Flow, a major British naval base in the Orkney Islands, you can see on the map on the right here, and she hit a German mine and she sank in high seas and, as I said, most of the people aboard died. There were 749 aboard, 737 of them drowned. There was a particularly famous passenger aboard, Lord Kitchener. He gave rise to the famous recruiting poster that would later inspire the American Uncle Sam recruiting poster. The reason he was aboard was that the Hampshire was taking him to Russia. It was going via a northerly route north of Scandinavia to take this famous British general to try to shore up Russian morale and keep them in the war because by June of 1916, there were already great concerns about the Russian war effort. Now, if you want to learn more about the sinking and Lord Kitchener and so on, I'm not going to talk much more about that, so I'm sure you can find much better videos elsewhere. I'm going to move on to an earlier part of the story of the Hampshire. And I get much of my information for, the, for this episode from this website, navalhistory.net. Now, I want to particularly note the creator of this, Gordon Smith, because he has passed away. This was not the creation of some organization or some university or something like that. It was a passion project of a single individual who loved the topic and did an astonishing job. He collected logbooks from all over the place. If you have any interest in British warships in World War I or World War II or probably other wars as well, you go here and you get an astonishing wealth of information. Now, I've seen it before that there are great websites like this, and then the person who runs it dies or gets sick, and they don't pay for the domain anymore, and the website just dies and goes away, and it's a tragedy for all concerned. In this case, however, Gordon Smith's family has chosen to keep the website alive as a memorial to their family member who is now gone, and I'm very, very glad indeed that they have. Now, one of the wonderful things you find on this website are maps that Gordon Smith created showing you where the ships are using their logbooks. And you can see here that there is this squiggly mess down there south of India, and then she leaves India and heads through the Suez Canal and eventually ends up in the Orkney Islands north of Scotland, and that's where she meets her terrible fate. So what's going on here with this mess of a pattern here? They're going up and down and east and west. What on earth is the Hampshire doing? Well, this actually intersects with an earlier story that I told when I was talking about the German East Asia Squadron. In my episode about their the late departure of the New Zealand Expeditionary Force, why they left New Zealand in October instead of September when they had originally planned in 1914. It was because the German East Asia Squadron had headed into the South Pacific, had gone to Samoa, had gone to French Polynesia and so on, and I told you already that they then headed towards South America. What I did not discuss at the time was the fact that they detached one of the light cruisers to go have fun in the Indian Ocean. The light cruiser Emden went into the Indian Ocean with the specific orders basically to go pirate, intercept as much British shipping as you can, damage port facilities, 
do whatever damage you can possibly get away with. And she did a truly astonishing job. And the Hampshire's job was to search for the Emden. There were many other warships there, but in this case, the Hampshire's job was to patrol south of India, especially because they were concerned the Emden might try to keep heading to the west, perhaps go down to South Africa and intercept British shipping in that area of the world. That was what the Hampshire was doing. Now, there are quite a lot of pictures and photos. There are even kit set models you can buy of the Emden. As I said, a famous ship indeed. But her story ended on November the 9th, 1914, when one of the escorts for that Anzac fleet carrying my grandfather was dispatched when an SOS call was heard from not too far over the horizon. Nobody quite knew what was about, but the Sydney was dispatched to investigate it, and she confronted the Emden. There was an epic one-on-one -on -one sea battle. The Sydney emerged victorious. To avoid sinking, the Emden beached herself on a nearby atoll, and that was the end of the Emden story. So, no more search pattern required from the Hampshire. So what was the Hampshire going to do now? Well, we can learn all about the movements of the Hampshire, and this is how he was able to create these wonderful maps, because he went in and he got original scans of the logbooks of dozens and dozens of British warships. And these logbooks are a amazing wealth of information. They record things about the individual ship, like the distance run, the compass course, etc., etc. But there's also other invaluable information, the wind direction and force, the weather conditions, barometer readings, temperature readings. I could well imagine a climate researcher who wanted to reconstruct what was going on in the Indian Ocean, or indeed any ocean, going into these British Navy logbooks, and you could get an astonishing wealth of data about temperature and barometer readings and wind directions and so on and so on, and see if there'd been any major changes over the last hundred years. What else do you find? Well, again, you get things about the individual ship, you get its latitude and its longitude, and interesting to observe, DR and OBS. DR is dead reckoning, where they thought they were according to their own calculations, observational um, information they've got from looking at the sun, the stars, etc. And fascinating to see that there are slight differences. There's the sick list. How many med men aboard the ship are sick? You can track trends. Are they getting more and more sailors sick or are the numbers going down? You could potentially track the spread of epidemics by using this. Other interesting information. How much fresh water were they carrying? How much fresh water were they using? How much fresh water were they manufacturing by distillation? How much coal were they carrying? How much coal were they using? I could see people interested in the efficiency of steam engines and things like that being, um, well, fascinated by this information. But in our case, the information that we care about for this episode is in this section. At 8 p.m. on the night of 12th of November, it says communicated with Melbourne. Now, a little bit of backstory here. HMS Minotaur had been the flagship of the Anzac fleet, but she had recently left for other purposes. That left the Melbourne as the flagship of the fleet. So that's who she's communicating with, the warship who is in charge of the entire fleet. And there she is, HMAS Melbourne, a member of the Australian Navy. And then the next day in the logbook, 13th November, Colombo to Indian Ocean, latitude and longitude, etc. 7.50 a.m., sighted Ibuki, altered course, 8 a.m., course and speed as requisite, for communicating with Ibuki and taking station ahead of the convoy. So the Hampshire went to join the fleet and provide an additional escort, because by this stage they were actually down to only two warships. There was the Melbourne and the Ibuki, and nobody else was left. The Minotaur had already gone, the Sydney had gone off to fight the Emden, and had then picked up prisoners and was doing other duties, and had not yet returned to the fleet. She would rejoin them at Colombo. So they only had two warships to escort about 30,000 men. So they needed another one. The Hampshire went in 
to join them. And this photo shows you some of the ships refreshing their coal supplies while they are at Colombo. And again, this photo is special to me because it was taken from my grandfather's transport and it shows native laborers, as they called them, or coolies in, in fact, bringing coal to the side of the ship and passing it up where it could be, well, put in the ship's stores. In the background, you actually see HMAS Sydney, who has now returned and rejoined the fleet after her battle with the Emden. And then it's time to go on November the 17th, 2 a.m., raise steam in 12 boilers. 11.45 a.m., cast off boys, proceeded as requisite for leaving harbour. Takes quite a while to build up steam from those coal-driven engines. Noon, course and speed as requisite for taking, taking station on convoy. 1 p.m., convoy's course north, 70 west. Speed, 10 knots. And this is the next part of that map. They're leaving Sri Lanka and they are passing through the Arabian Sea. They'll go up through the Suez Canal and go on from there. 18th November, convoys course north 78 west, speed 10 knots. Course and speed is requisite for keeping in touch with convoy. Course and speed is requisite for closing steamer. Course and speed is requisite for closing convoy. Naturally enough, you get a lot of entries like that and I'm not going to touch on all of them because it would make for a terribly boring episode. So let's just assume that there's a lot of entries that look like that over the next few days. Let's just have a look at some of the more interesting incidents that occur as they escorted these Australian and New Zealand transports. 19th November. Convoy altered course north 75 west reduced weight knots. Ascanius hauled out of line course and speed as requisite for speaking to Ascanius. Ascanius was one of the Australian troop ships. Why? What was going on there? Actually, we don't know. I mentioned in a previous episode that I had visited the UK National Archives in London and I had got copies of a lot of the logbooks for these different troop transports. And indeed, I did get a copy of the Ascanius. And they have an entry in their logbook for the 11th of November. And the next entry is the 21st of November. There's nothing at all for the 19th of November. But the events of the 20 that are noted in her entry of the 21st probably give us some context of why the Ascanius had fallen out of line. 21st November, 4.40 a.m. Course and speed is requisite for assisting ships in collision, Ascanius and Shropshire. 6.20 a.m. Stopped. Picked up capsized boat. Now let's turn to the logbook of the Ascanius and see what was recorded there. At about 4.35 a.m. this morning, the steamship Shropshire suddenly dropped astern and we collided. Ships were in convoy, keeping four cables apart. She, after collision, signalled two men overboard, two life boys with the lights dropped overboard. I did not lower boat to prevent any panic amongst troops after collision. Immediately after collision, troops all mustered with life jackets with their officers, watertight doors attended to, boats all cast adrift, and their crews at stations. The previous evening, Shropshire missed me. He would show red light near stern in case he came astern suddenly. This was not done. We have extensive damage to port bow and loss of number 10 boat. In other words, the Shropshire was the next ship ahead of the Ascanius, and suddenly she slowed down, and that led to the Ascanius rapidly catching up to her, and in this case, actually colliding. The behaviour of troops and crew was most excellent. No panic, whatever. And since this was a fairly significant accident, I think they wanted to make sure there were plenty of witnesses backing up the account of this. So this entry is signed by multiple people. The senior Australian officer commanding the soldiers aboard, the ship's master, the officer of the watch, and the first mate. Four witnesses signing this statement. I also checked out the logbook of the Shropshire, and there's nothing particularly interesting beyond this to note, so I won't bother quoting it anymore. On the other hand, we have an account from another Australian who was nearby, R.T. Voles. He was a wireless operator aboard an Australian transport that had come out of Tasmania, and the ship was called the Katuna. And I have to say, out of all of the primary sources and letters and diaries I've come across, Vols is my favourite. 
He has a lot of really interesting detail, and he's also quite a character and tells lots of funny stories. And this is how he tells the story of the collision. At 2 a.m., it was stifling with the heat, which was increasing each day. I was sitting on the rail in my pajamas, having some air and ready to duck if Captain Jackson should appear, as he often prowled around at any hour. About 4 a.m., I heard a kind of hissing and moaning. Looking ahead, I saw a Varys light, a white rocket, racing skywards. This was a prearranged signal to stand by the radio for urgent message. To show how watchful our signalers were, I'd received and delivered the message before he woke up. So that's a rather sarcastic comment, as you can see. The signaler is the one supposed to be looking for things like the rockets. He was fast asleep, but Vols had spotted it and already done his job before he came in and said, I think there was a rocket. It was the Euripides of the 3rd Division calling his division to stop their engines at once, two men overboard. As it did not concern our division, I waited, and shortly afterwards, the Orvieto called the 1st Division to stop their engines immediately, and added operators not to leave instruments until further orders. When they're talking about divisions here, the ships are traveling in columns. So one column will be a division. The Orvieto is the what they call the flag transport. It's the commanding transport ship that has the Australian general aboard. Here was a problem. To send the message up to the bridge and to stay at, or to stay at the instruments. However, I left them and called Captain Jackson, giving him the message. I was astonished to see him with all his bedclothes on and a kind of coat over him, as if it were cold. Damn it! What do they want to fall overboard at this time of day for? he asked. I could not explain and left him to reason it out. As I took up the phones again, I heard HMS Hampshire calling the Orvieto and telling the flagship to lead the first division away. The tones were so sharp and precise that I thought the cruiser was about to blaze away at somebody. Were they under attack? Was the Hampshire about to enter battle? The Orvieto thereupon repeated the direction to be taken, but several of the sub-flagships jammed in and caused me to miss part of it. So as a wireless operator, if multiple people are all broadcasting at the same time, they're going to jam each other. And that's the problem. Everybody's broadcasting. Vols can't get the signal. I was in a fix, as we were liable to run the next transport down or be run down ourselves. And they all depended on my receiving the message. To add to my anxiety, the second officer repeatedly called down the ventilator. Anything doing? Shut up! I yelled back. How can I hear you with you yapping? Sorry, how can I hear with you yapping? It was not very polite, but it served the purpose. Luckily, the message was repeated, and I got the position. Looking outside the door, the transport the, looking outside the door, the transports were rather out of line, and the Hampshire and Ibuki had their searchlights on two transports. I felt very shaky after this little item, and felt very relieved when we were all on the way once more. The promptness in which the cruisers acted was wonderful and just showed that they were prepared for an emergency. And there is the Hampshire once again. That's actually Port Said. And here's the next significant logbook entry on 2nd of December. 4 a.m. stopped, secured head and stern to boys of 2nd Island. 10 a.m. coaling ship, native labour. 3 p.m. German prisoners of war from SS Orvieto and Monganui joined ship. In my research, this was the first time I realized that there were German prisoners of war aboard my grandfather's transport, the Monganui. I had known that the, one of the German princes who was actually aboard the Emden was aboard the Orvieto, but this highlighted the fact that there were also Germans on the Monganui. I'll probably come back and talk about them another day. And fortunately for us, we actually have, in English, an entire book written by that German prince I just mentioned, and it's freely available on the internet, and I was able to download the whole thing and read the account of what the German thought about his time as a prisoner aboard the Hampshire. In the Hampshire, we were received by Captain Grant, the captain of the cruiser, with great cordiality. It was noticeable at once that we were among members of our own profession. The whole tone was far warmer. 
that we were received so cordially by the Hampshire was especially remarkable, as this ship had been detailed to chase us. Captain Grant had carried out the search admirably, but our luck and his ill luck had brought us safely through. Our accommodation in the Hampshire was very good indeed. The English captain had completely abandoned his cabin to us. We could go on deck at any time, which was very pleasant at sea and in good weather. Another friendly action of Captain Grant was that he presented us with German and English books which he had bought specially for us a short time before. Wireless messages were coming in daily about the war, which contained fascinating news for us. Thanks to the kindness and chivalry of Captain Grant, we were given these messages to read. We thus heard the news of the victory of Spee's squadron over the English squadron at Coronel. Spee's squadron is the German East Asia squadron. The Emden had been attached to this and had then been sent from the Pacific into the Indian Ocean to go solo. So that news was very, very close to them because they were their shipmates and comrades who they had been serving with at Qingdao in China for a long time before. On Sunday, December 6th, the worst day of my life, we reached a Malta. The difference between Navy and Army met the eye and air at once. The hearty friendship of our professional fellows was missing now. Coldness and hardness were already noticeable in the tone of the Army officers. Well, I'll probably again come back and revisit the story of this guy, Franz Joseph, Prince of Hohenzollern, but that's all we're going to hear from him today. And to my surprise and pleasure, I was able to find a photo of the Hampshire at Malta on this particular occasion. I cannot say if they had yet disembarked the German prisoners. 10.10 10 a.m. Course and speed is requisite for entering Grand Harbour. 10.50 a.m. Discharge German prisoners of war. And that's all I've got, except to finish again with the fate of the Hampshire. because. In June of 1916, she would go down with almost all hands aboard. And on the 100th anniversary of her sinking, there was a memorial held in the Orkney Islands at this, um, this location. This is, in fact, a HMS Hampshire memorial, and it has the names of all of the men who were lost, including, of course, Lord Kitchener. And I looked for Captain Gordon's name and realized it wasn't there because he had been lucky enough to have been replaced by another man as captain of this ship. So Captain Gordon, who the German prisoner liked so much, was spared what would have been a terrible fate. And you know me, I'm always interested in the last name Fowler, because that was the last name of my grandfather, whose story I'm following. And I saw on this memorial stone there was an A.T. Fowler, so I looked him up. His name was Alfred Fowler, and he was listed as the civilian, a canteen assistant. No relative. But as I said, I see the name Fowler, I home in on it and try and see what I can learn. And that's all I have for you today.